So thank you for joining me today in what I'm hoping is going to be the ultimate guide to the cranial nerve examination. We've had the demonstration of the cranial nerves, so we've seen what things should look like when they're going smoothly. We've had the audio podcast of you know, the background to the cranial nerves. And today we're going to dig into the whys. What are we doing? Why are we looking for these things? And how should we be performing the examination? I brought along a couple of my friends here today, and hopefully these guys are going to help us get a good insight to what's going on inside the skull and how each of the cranial nerves is functioning. So there are 12 cranial nerves. With that in mind, let's start off with cranial nerve one, the olfactory nerve, your sense of smell. Cranial nerve one is a purely sensory nerve. So smells are brought up the nostrils, they get moved around by the turbinates, which are then detected by um, nerves coming through the cribriform plate. The cribriform plate is actually labelled number 29 here, and you can see the nerves are actually coming through this bone. And this is these nerves that get stimulated by um, nasal, um, well, nasal smells coming up. So we've got a couple of brains here, which we'll probably be using quite a bit in this discussion. I mean, I'm sure that most people are familiar with the general shape of the brain. Kind of looks like a cauliflower, but just a little bit pink. It's only when we flip the brain over that we can see the brain stem and where an awful lot of the cranial nerves are coming out. In terms of cranial nerve one, we can see these two long appendages uh, at the base of the brain. They will connect into the cribriform plate that we've discussed before and allow smells to be detected by the brain itself. So the first step of testing the cranial nerves is to show that the patient's nostrils are patent. So that they've not got anything blocking it or they've not got any large turbinates or polyps up there. So what we'll do is we'll get the patient to cover one nostril and breathe in and do the same again on the opposite side. By getting them to breathe in, it makes sure any nasties that might be living up there stay up there, rather than getting the patient to breathe them out all over the place. Once we've shown that the nostrils are patent, we then need to give the patient a smell to see whether or not they can detect it. A lot of places use coffee granules and things like that, but I find I don't have those on my desk. What I do, however, normally have is some alcogel. So you get the patient to close their eyes, and ask them if they can smell anything. You just take the alcogel, put it under their nostril, and see if they can smell something. Most people would actually be familiar with the smell of alcohol anyway, so would certainly be able to uh, comment that it's there, or at least detect the presence of a smell. So given our intense interest in the patient's nose suddenly and their sense of smell, I think it'd be worthwhile to ask you guys a question. What do you think the commonest cause of lack of sense of smell or anosmia is? Give yourself a couple of seconds. It'd be useful if you could come up with at least three uh, potential causes. Okay, so in terms of the commonest cause of uh, loss of sense of smell, we're going to be talking about a blocked nose. Nothing simpler than that. Just um, nose full of mucus, obviously not allowing smell to get up um, and stimulate the uh, cranial nerve there. Hay fever is another big one, as is smoking and nasal polyps. If we've actually got the area inside the nose here blocked, then obviously you're not going to be able to smell anything. So in terms of cranial nerve one, are there any big nasties that we need to be aware of? Well, to be honest, it's going to be anything that's going to be affecting this area here, just the base of the skull where the brain sits, where that cribriform plate is. Now, there's something called a contra-coup injury. If you get a direct blow to the head, which moves the brain backwards, the brain can actually smack into the back of the skull and rip the, um, the nerves out of that cribriform plate. And that's a big um, injury that's frequently seen in major car accidents and things like that, where there's been a significant head trauma, where that force has transmitted from the skull through the brain and moved the brain with it, simply ripping off that cribriform plate. So in the a &E department, for example, if you've got a patient that can't smell anything, that might be indicating they have a problem with a cranial nerve, one lesion. Now, what about the other way? What about if you've got new smells or smells that you didn't expect before? 
you can have something called phantosmia, um, and that's seen in things like epilepsy, or again, tumors, where you've got stimulation of the frontal lobe giving strange, unusual smells, sometimes described as a burning toast type smell. Have you noticed any changes with your nose at all? Okay, so no blocked nose, anything like that? Okay, so, so if you could put a finger over one nostril and breathe in and relax, and we'll do the same again on the opposite side. Super. So I've got um, a substance here. If you close your eyes, tell me what you can smell, if anything. Coffee. Super. Okay, that confirms everything's working there. Thank you. Okay. I think that pretty much wraps up everything that we need to know on the cranial nerves. We've discussed how the examination is being done and what we're looking for. Let's move on to cranial nerve two, the optic nerve.